This is a shortened version of a technology webinar that I put on for Washington University. Four opportunities and one warning for technology leaders that are thinking about implementing deep learning. These are the four opportunities. Automation, that's basically using deep learning to automate processes, not necessarily completely removing the human from the equation. This is not a binary operation. Often the machine will help the human. Augmented reality, this is simply blending things in from the neural networks into reality. And this is not as uncommon as you might think. Augmented reality is all around us. Prediction, this is what neural networks and other machine learning have done for ages. Personalization, allowing a personalized experience, making recommendations for you, the consumer, or whoever is the beneficiary of the neural network. And one caution, we'll get to that later, so stick around to the end of the video. And while you're at it, subscribe or like. First, what is deep learning? Now, marketing people have completely ruined these terms. I hear it's not artificial intelligence. We move beyond that. It's cognitive reasoning or other, other various things. The way that I define these is AI is the overarching goal of making computers operate at a human level and beyond. Whereas machine learning is learning from data. You give the machine data, it learns from it. And then deep learning is a type of machine learning. So really, where does deep learning actually fit in with all of these technologies? You've got computers. So I really view artificial intelligence sort of exists in a computer. I guess you could do it all on paper, but what would be the fun in that? Machine learning comes under artificial intelligence. And then neural networks. There's a bunch of different types of neural networks. There's convolution neural networks, reinforcement neural networks, GANs, generative adversarial neural networks. There are LSTM, etc. There's a lot of different types of neural networks in this broad category, but fundamentally deep learning is neural networks. So why neural networks? Why deep learning? This is a diagram by Andrew Ning that I've seen a number of places. This is how academics work. This is how anybody hawking a new idea works. You've got the older algorithms. You've got what they're presenting, which is deep learning. So they're presenting basically how their algorithm outperforms the other ones. And I agree with this. Deep learning needs a lot of data. If you don't have a lot of data, it's not necessarily going to go as well. Deep learning, and that's one of the criticisms as well, you show it a million cats, you show it a million dogs, it'll learn to tell the difference between them. Let's start with prediction. This is what a lot of people start with, with data science, and neural networks can definitely be used for this. Often when you think of prediction, you think of classic predictive modeling. Here I have the Pima Indian dataset, which is available from many sources, Kaggle, UCI, others. It's attempting to predict if the individual has diabetes. And this is very similar to a lot of, a lot of where you start with data science. It's tabular data, it's not images. Images, sound, unstructured data, that is what neural networks are really, really good at. But they can do this too. So can random forests and support vector machines, et cetera, et cetera. But you're looking at that yellow column or part of a column where the values are missing. You've got your label data. That's the top part. That is what you train the model on. Hopefully you have more than just this. And then you've got the unlabeled new data coming in that you do not have the label for. And you would like the machine learning model, in this case a deep neural network, to predict that part for you. Now the inputs here are columns in a database. So it's, it's almost like you can pick a column in Excel and like magic, the neural network or whatever is going to fill in the blanks for you when you don't have that column. Deep learning, ideally, the input is going to be a lot less structured. It's going to be video, audio, images. It can be almost anything, really, text. Applications of this is time series. You can predict which way the stock market is going, maybe. Unsupervised learning, supervised learning. 
supervised learning would be like that model that we saw there where it is looking at do you have diabetes or not. Unsupervised would be putting in all that data but no labels and it's going to cluster the people into different areas and you might find something real interesting. You might find type 1 diabetes, type 2 diabetes, no diabetes, and then you might realize there's some subtypes of type 1 or type 2. I don't know. Those are the kind of things you can do with unsupervised learning. Automation. This one's fun. I often am talking to somebody and I'm a data scientist. Oh, you're the guy trying to put me out of a job. And yes, I am. But if it makes you feel any better, data scientists, we're trying to put each other out of a job just as fast as you. That is data scientists trying to automate their own job. And AutoML can do some amazing things, but it's not to the point where you see chess and go where on Kaggle the machine can simply dominate it and it's an order of magnitude above the top humans. Now many of the top humans are probably using AutoML aspects to their solutions. Self-driving cars, this is the classic one. And again, this is a good example why this is not binary. I remember getting my first car with anti-lock brakes, and really that's some of the beginnings of self-driving cars. Then I got GPS, and then collision avoidance, and all these things. They keep adding on more and more features to these cars, and eventually they become fully autonomous at some point. Or at least so they tell me. Reinforcement learning. This is another tag. Reinforcement, you usually see it for games, but really it's anything where you have a series of actions that you would like for your neural network to perform, and it gets rewards for doing it better. Rather than just classifying something, it's actually seeing the steps needed to actually cause a desired outcome to occur. Robo-doctors and therapists and brokers basically using chatbots to actually be able to perform some of these actions like helping you buy an insurance policy or invest in a mutual fund or diagnose your symptoms. In the world of COVID, this is very, very important and something that is actively being looked at. And of course, there's the hybrid human machine augmentation. Cars are very much like this now where you're working together as a team, the GPS and other things, but the human driver is really dealing with the things that the machines simply cannot deal with at this point. Personalization. This allows products to be tuned very specifically to you. Perhaps insurance policies that are hyper-local to the area that you're actually purchasing them in for property casualty. Perhaps being able to get a recommendation on stocks or, it, or policies or other things that are very, very focused on you. Recommendations on what you should buy, like if you log into Amazon. Now, this personalization does bring up some privacy concerns. If you're sitting next to somebody else and both of you Google the same thing, you're going to get different results. That is because Google is showing bias to what it thinks you would like to see. And this is what gets Google into some trouble sometimes because they feel like it's censoring certain information. And it is. It's blocking it because it doesn't think that you would be interested in it. Or at least that's what they claim it's doing. Same company that also takes money from advertisers. So it's natural that there are some questions as far as why those results come back. Now back in the good old days when I used my Netscape browser to go to Alta Vista, everybody got the same results. And this can be kind of tricky because, I don't know, maybe I'm a YouTuber, maybe I want to see the search rank of my video. And it sees, oh, Jeff Heaton is searching for Jeff Heaton. Well, Jeff Heaton is probably really important to Jeff Heaton, so go ahead and I'm going to go ahead and put his stuff first. And then I'm looking at it and saying, yeah, I've got my, my SEO is working. And it's really not. But it will work better if you like or subscribe to this video. We also do market segmentation, breaking people into groups, personas where you try to group people into different types of, of buyers, and recommender systems like I mentioned with Amazon where you log in and it, it immediately bombards you with all of the books and other things that it thinks that you would like to buy.
Augmented Reality. This is great. I'm particularly interested in this one and hope to be doing some more stuff on augmented reality on this channel. But this is really all around us. If you think of even noise canceling headphones, that's augmented reality. It's taking that audio stream and removing what it thinks is noise. Again, kind of like Google, removing search results that it thinks is noise. But it's reality, it's the audio of the environment around you coming to you, or it's the music you listen to minus the noises in the background. Now, in the world of Zoom, thanks to COVID, it can get rid of things in the background, like a barking dog. You didn't hear him, right? He interrupts sometimes, but that's, that's Hickory, my dog. So that could be filtered out in a, in a meeting. You can also deal with people that speak different languages. I could have a meeting with somebody who speaks Spanish and Chinese, and we would all hear each other in our native language or language that we chose to speak that day. I only speak one. And that would let the meaning flow very, very naturally. You could, you could choose your own language and even dialect. Now, deep fakes, as fun as it is to use Donald Trump or Joe Biden as a sock puppet and put words in their mouth, maybe make them say nice things about each other, I don't know. That's a novelty. That has no real use to business, at least not that would land you in the courtroom. However, one thing that I see potentially for this is I really like watching foreign films. My wife is a foreign language teacher. I really enjoyed watching Wandering Earth, but I only speak two words in Mandarin and they're the same thing, Shay Shay. So I can't really understand that movie in its, its native language. So I have to listen to the dub because I also can't keep up with reading the captions quick enough. But imagine if the same technology for the deep face would let me actually hear those Chinese actors and others in the, in the film speaking Mandarin and let me actually hear that with their same emotion in their same voice and I can hear it in English and it doesn't sound like the really, really bad dubs that you get on some of the, the old DVDs where you could swap in your, your desired audio track. Shopping and tourism. I've already used cell phone apps when I was in Europe where I could just point it up at a building and watch the Spanish go into English or the French go into English, that sort of thing. Very, very handy. Or I can point it at my menu as I'm sitting there and trying to actually order something in this language that I don't understand and trying to get those characters typed into maybe a Google Translate, you just point it at it and you see the, the words change into the language that you understand. Now, the people at Washington University got to ask me Q&A at this point. That's what the comments are for. So leave comments, leave likes. Have I mentioned maybe subscribing yet? I don't know. Anyway, on to the next one. The caution. Deep learning is completely naive. It does not reason. I've sat in where startup companies have pitched us chatbots and they do amazing things. And sometimes they don't let me talk to the chatbot because they're, I don't know, they're afraid of computer science guys, AI guys, I guess. But just a real simple question that I asked that tripped that particular chatbot up, which is a, a perfectly fine product for maybe. But nonetheless, I was talking to this bot and I basically told it, yeah, I saw my mother-in-law this weekend and it responded something with, oh, great. Do you guys have a good relationship? And I said, yeah, sure. Can I ask you a question? And the chat bot says, yeah, sure. Anything. Am I married? And the chat bot responded with, I hope you meet somebody. Okay. That was kind of funny because I told it about my mother-in-law. That implies that I'm married. No possibility for reasoning there. And it also told me that it hoped I met someone. So whatever. That is the, uh, that is the conversation that I had briefly with a free conversational, uh, chatbot that then they would gen generalize to whatever you're trying to have it do, handle customer support, whatever. But they want it to seem human and friendly. But it's really only dealing with about one sentence at a time, which is why you have 
some very popular YouTube videos where they have a chatbot talk to a chatbot, which is just painful. Yes, I know you are. Speaking to the caution, Eugene Vorbacek, a professor at Washington University, I've met him and been to one presentation by him, very renowned researcher in the area of adversarial example attacks and other things related to security and these models, machine learning, deep learning in particular. You might have seen the single pixel attacks. These are really interesting. It shows that fundamentally we really do not know a lot about what these weights in the neural network are really doing. We have some ideas. We can do visualization showing that the different filters are learning different things. But just this single pixel that you see here will, like the, the horse, it changes it into a dog, just that one black pixel. Now it's using machine learning to figure out what pixel to put into there. But you're learning to you're learning to exploit this algorithm. More advanced ones, adversarial example. You're putting in this noise into the image, and you can see adding the noise it makes the image look identical almost to our human eyes anyway. But it changes the stop sign to a yard sign, and it changes a pig to an airliner. I guess when pigs fly, it'll figure it out. Okay, that was bad, but couldn't resist. This sort of thing is, and it deals with example poisoning, where you might put fake data in with the real data to exploit later. The thing is, I remember the early days of the internet when things were great, when you did Telnet with no encryption, everything was HTTP. It was the naive babe in the woods days of neural, of the internet. And then the security people needed in, and the cyber people, and we need them because they made the internet they're trying to make the internet safer for everybody. Now, neural networks are kind of like that early unsecured internet. Usually the neural networks and others are encased in some sort of a protective shell that the cyber folks put there for us, but the neural networks are, they're naive geniuses, like the, the baby that I showed you on the opening slide for this part. The other thing too, as we get scores available for different things, like one thing that the insurance industry I've seen is looking at a picture and predicting somebody's BMI, so overall body mass index, so how healthy is an individual. You might be able to learn to game the system. What's your BMI without facial hair, with facial hair, maybe with just a mustache, maybe with glasses without glasses. How can you game the system and get the best possible score? We've been doing this for ages, at least with American style, credit scores. I'm sure the other countries probably do that as well. Ways that you can do things to improve your credit score. Because it's just like an objective function. As soon as FICO put out the standard credit scoring information that then Experian and the others implemented, people began to study it and see how can we raise our credit score. Some of those things are good and obvious, like pay your bills on time, don't go into massive debt but others are just kind of little tricks that you can do to up it. The point is there's always people trying to game those models just as soon as you put those out. So that's sort of the warning of deep learning. It's learning to recognize, it's learning patterns, it's learning things that look just amazing when you watch it. You think that the singularity is here, but they're very naive pattern recognition based algorithms that really don't know exactly what they're doing. Inside, you can have the neural network that was able to beat the best Go players in the world, but it couldn't explain to you how it beat them or even how to play the game of Go. It knows that, but so they're very much one trick ponies. Thanks for watching this, and if you want to see other videos, more technical, how to actually implement all of this stuff, this was a video about why most of my videos are about how please subscribe to my channel and think about giving this video a like thank you very much